Steve and I have talked about um, we like it interactive. The problem is we got to get it all in, and it's hard to do interactive when you're on Zoom too. So what we thought we would do is just encourage you to ask questions if you don't understand what I say. I need to clarify, make it clearer, say it another way or something. And if you have some kind of interesting observation or you know, you know some, something that's related but not directly on point, let's save that for the Q&A, and then we can talk about it then. Okay? So, um, Hunt, why don't you open us up with prayer? Oh, Jesus. We, we thank you, Lord. We honor you tonight, Lord. So wonderful to be in your presence, Lord. To have you, Lord Jesus. You are everything, Lord. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this teaching, God. We thank you for having your way and speaking through Dan bringing out the questions, anything that needs to come out tonight, Lord Jesus, to reveal more of you, Lord, as we hunger after you. And Lord, we give you all, all, all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, Steve, go ahead and hit record. Tell me when. Go. All right, everybody, this is session five of our New Covenant Theology Seminar. I've called it the Law of Moses or the Law of Christ. If you recall, the Law of Moses uh, is that which New Covenant Theology believes has been done away with, replaced, abrogated, whatever you want to say, fulfilled is the best word. Or are New Testament Christians under the Law of Christ? That is the fundamental key dividing line between those two theologies. And so... They are certain there's two sections in the Sermon on the Mount that directly address that issue. The first are the so-called six antitheses, which is a common name the commentators give the but I say unto you, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. And then there's the famous passage where Jesus says, Not one dot or stroke of this law shall pass until heaven and earth pass away until all is accomplished. Now, if if you think about it, I'm going to be playing offense. You don't need to see that. I'm going to be playing offense on the six antitheses. You've heard it said, but I say unto you, and then that sounds like Jesus is changing Moses, and he's moving us from the law of Moses to the law of Christ. And I will. That's a, a weak spot for the Reformed people. they got to play defense, the covenant theologian people. But now they, uh, the one, not one dot of stroke shall pass. I'm going to have to play defense because that sounds like the law is here forever until the end of time. All right, so the law of Moses, the law of Christ. We'll start out the first part of the presentation on the six antitheses of the Sermon on the Mount, and then I'll finish up with the daughter of stroke verse. Now, what is an antithesis? Well, here's an example of the first one, Matthew 5, 21, 22a. You have heard that it was said to those of old. You notice I've highlighted those of old. You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. The but I say to you is the antithesis. You've heard it said of old, but there's the contrary. Antithesis just means an opposition, a contrast. But I say to you, everyone is angry. Now, if you look at that straight, it looks like Jesus is taking Moses, Ten Commandments, don't murder. But I say to you, don't be angry. He's changing the law of Moses and making it higher. Now, I wish it were that simple, or there wouldn't be any theological controversy, but unfortunately it's not. So how do covenant theology people deal with this? Well, new covenant theology people say that Moses' law has been abolished. Covenant theolog theology people say, no, the Pharisees have perverted Moses' law, and so these people that it was said of old, it was said to those of old, it was said by whom? By the Pharisees. And the Pharisees twisted Moses' law, and Jesus was trying to straighten the Pharisees out. What's the point of this? Is to keep Moses flat from the Old Testament to the New Testament, 
Moses is not changed by Jesus. We're still under the law of Moses. We don't need a new law of Christ. Now, it is absolutely essential to understand this thinking right here because this is the way that the argument goes in every antithesis. Now, I'm going to narrow the scope a little bit. We all, I'm only going to look at the difference between covenant theology and new covenant theology. Dispensational theology will likely agree with me with new covenant theology, so we'll leave that out. Steve kind of dealt with dispensationalism in the second, third, and fourth sessions. He kind of worked them over pretty good. This session, I'm going to work on our Presbyterian brothers, the Reformed Covenant folks. All right, so now, what's the difference between covenant theology and new covenant theology, just to make sure we've got it in our head? Who believes that that which was said of old was par pharisaic perversions of, of the law? That would be covenant theology. Who thinks that Moses was abolished? New covenant theology. Who says that Jesus enhanced Moses, made him tougher, going from you, show, you shouldn't murder to you shouldn't even be angry? Well, that would be New Covenant theology. Who says that Jesus merely exposits Moses or explains Moses? That would be Covenant theology. Because remember, Moses doesn't change. Jesus just explains the way Moses should be. And the Pharisees messed up Moses, but I'm going to tell you how Moses really is, according to covenant theologians. Who says that Jesus' law actually replaced Moses? That would be the new covenant theology people. Who says the law is flat from Moses to Christ? That's a term that's used by the theologians a lot. It's flat. It's a good metaphor. It means it doesn't change. That moral law of Moses lasts from Moses all the way to the end of time. Now, the burden of proof is on covenant theology, because if I can show that Jesus has changed just one of those six antitheses, well, then that means Moses' law has been changed. It's not flat. It might have gone up just a little bit instead of a lot, but just one, I win. NCT wins, because that's all it takes. In other words, the burden of proof is on covenant theology to show that none of these antitheses changed Moses. Moses is flat. He's not changed at all. Now, my main source from this presentation is a book I need to recommend to you, But I Say Unto You by John D. Riesinger. And he goes into this, of course, in much greater detail. You can get it on Kindle, I think, for about 10 bucks. I've read it thoroughly and gone back to use it. All right, so we're going to start out with the six antitheses first. First, I'm going to lay them out for you. Of old, you heard it, you shouldn't murder, but now Jesus says, I say unto you, but I say unto you, no anger. You've heard it said of old that adultery is wrong, but I say unto you, don't even lust. The third antithesis, you have heard that Moses gave you uh, a certificate of divorce, easy divorce, we'll call it. Jesus says, no hard divorce, only for sexual immorality. Fourth antithesis, you've heard of old that False oaths were bad, and I'm telling you that no, don't take any oath at all. The fifth antithesis, you've heard it said that you should not, that an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, retribution, in other words. And Jesus says, no, turn the other cheek. And the sixth antithesis, you have heard of, of old, it was said to hate your enemy, but Jesus says, no, love your enemy. Now, you're all familiar with this, but I know from having gone through this that the Sermon on the Mount is one of the most difficult passages to interpret. And one reason I've always had trouble with it is because I've always interpreted it from a reformed point of view. I've always bought into that, well, it's Jesus is dealing with a perversion of the Pharisees. Well, I found out that doesn't work. Let's start with antithesis number one, murder versus anger. Here's the quote that Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those of old. There's the thesis, if you will, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that's the name of the Reed Singer's book, there's the antithesis, I'm contradicting what was said to you of old, I'm changing things, I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment, and so forth, okay? So, here's the New Covenant theology position. Moses never said anything about anger, he just said don't murder. So Jesus changed Moses' law when he said don't anger, don't be angry. 
That's pretty strong, straightforward. How do the covenant theology people answer that? Well, they say that the Pharisees twisted Moses. Now, I, what I did is I went and found a reformed commentary, and I went, it's a, a guy named Hendrickson, a very good commentator I've used a lot, and I went to his commentary on Matthew and went to Matthew uh, 5, and I wanted to see how much evidence they have that, Fer that the Pharisees did twist Moses. And on five of the six antitheses, I found out they had absolutely none. And I've been seeing this over and over again. There's no evidence. Now, here's what Hendrickson said about the Pharisees dealing with this commandment about not murdering. Their interpretation, though correct as far as it went, did not go nearly far enough. Why? Because the Pharisees weren't pointing out the spiritual cause of murder. So what the covenant theology people are saying is, yeah, Moses said don't murder, but what he meant was don't murder and have anger in your, in your heart. And so Jesus, when Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry, he's not really changing Moses because Moses meant he included anger with murder. And so Jesus is not really changing murder, uh, changing uh, Moses. Now, Hendrickson gives no sites to prove his case. His commentary is that thick. He had plenty of room. The reason is there's no proof that the Pharisees weren't pointing out spiritual causes of murder. There's no, th this is just a made up defense. They didn't go far enough and say, don't be angry. Uh, excuse me, the Pharisees weren't pointing out the spiritual cause of murder. They were saying don't murder externally, but they weren't pointing out the internal affairs of the heart. Well, of course, that's what Jesus was doing. Moses was writing a civil code. He wasn't worried about in internal attitudes of the heart too much. There's some, but not a lot. But Jesus is more concerned about the internal attitude of the heart. Well, if you're a Reformed person, a covenant person, theology person, all you've got to do is say, well, the Pharisees uh, did the same thing as Moses. They only emphasized the external. Jesus emphasized the internal. So therefore, Jesus is changing the Pharisees. He's not messing with Moses. Now, another uh, tack that covenant theology people say is, the Mosaic law doesn't have this phrase, whoever murders will be liable to judgment. So Jesus said, you have heard it said of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Actually, that's true. That phrase in there is not in there. It was added. New Covenant theology would respond and say, well, what? Does Jesus have to quote Mosaic law word for word? There's no need to quote the obvious. If you murder somebody, of course you're going to be liable for judgment. Why do you insist that in order for Jesus to be quoting Moses, he's got to quote every little jot and tittle that Moses spoke? Jesus obviously quoted enough to show that he was quoting Moses, and he was not quoting the Pharisees. All right, so I'm the scorekeeper here. We're going to do a little contest here between New Covenant Theology and Covenant Theology. So far, NCT1, Covenant Theology, nothing. This is my opinion, of course, I'm biased, but you know, he who controls the microphone controls the school board, I guess. Let's look at antithesis number two, adultery versus lust. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And by the way, I think what he means by lustful intent, he means to actually get the woman in bed and have sex with her. I don't mean, he, he takes a glance at her and says, oh, she's hot or she's sexy. I think he's talking about, you know, you're really going after the woman to commit adultery with her. But that's neither here nor there. The point is that whatever Jesus did, it looks like, well, he did change something. The question is, did he change Moses? New Covenant theology wins, or did he change the Pharisees? Now, the New Covenant theology people say, look, Jesus is quoting word for word from Mosaic law. You shall not commit adultery. If you look in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, you get just word for word. It sounds like he's quoting Moses. And not only that, the Pharisees taught it was wrong to lust, so you can't say that Jesus was really contradicting the Pharisees. Now, to prove that Moses, that the Pharisees taught it was wrong to lust, I got a great quote here from John Gill, the um, commentator. He's a rabbinic expert. Listen, this is what one of the Pharisees said about lusting after a woman. 
It is not lawful to look upon a beautiful woman, though unmarried, nor upon another man's wife, though deformed, nor upon a woman's colored garments. So you can't even compliment a woman on how nice her dress looks because then you're lusting. They forbid looking on a woman's little finger and say that, and say that he that tells money to a woman, that means gives you hand money to a woman like a clerk. If you give money to a woman out of his hand into hers, that he may look upon her. He can't even catch her face, catch her eye. He's got to look at the money. Though he is possessed of the law and good works, even as Moses, he, he shall not escape the damnation of hell. So the Pharisee said, if you give money to a woman as a clerk or for any reason, you're going to hell. That's, that's saying don't lust in spades, on steroids. They affirm that he who looks upon a woman's heel, his children shall not be virtuous. And that a man may not go after a woman in the way, nor after his wife. You can't even, you can't even, you can't even, you can't even lust after your wife. Meet her on a bridge. You must take her to the side of him. And whoever goes through a river after a woman, I don't know why you would go into a river after a woman, except maybe just get trying to get to the other side. You shall have no part in the world to come. Nay, they forbid a man looking on the beauty of his own wife. Yeah, so that's pretty. They yes. sound almost Islamic. Huh? It sounds almost Islamic. Uh, yeah. Well, Islam is Islam is very legalistic, just like the Pharisees yeah. were. All right, screen sharing has stopped. I have screwed something up here. I hit the wrong button. Let me get it back. I closed the window. All right, I got to go back to PowerPoint. Hold on just a second. PowerPoint, where are you? You should have got it back, did you? Yes. 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 All right. Then uh, let me get on the right PowerPoint here. Let me get through here real quick. Wish I hadn't hit the wrong button. That messed me up pretty good here. Tell you what, let me minimize that and go find it over here. Well, 17, I'm not anywhere near where I need to be. Apologize for that. All right. So, what do the covenant theology people say about this antithesis that? You're not supposed to lust as opposed to somebody in, in olden days saying you shouldn't commit adultery. Well, they say that when Moses explicitly condemned adultery, he implicitly condemned lust. In other words, Moses is actually saying here, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Uh, and when you commit adultery, obviously you're lusting. So that when Jesus says don't lust, He's saying the same thing that Moses said. Moses says, don't commit adultery and implicitly don't lust because you have to commit lust to commit adultery. And therefore, when, you, when Jesus says don't lust, he's saying the same thing as Moses. So we're flat from Moses to Jesus. There's no change in the Mosaic law. And further, the covenant theology people say that the Pharisees failed to teach about lust which, of course, as we've just seen, is not true. I just gave you that long quote from John Gill about what the Pharisees believed about lust. And so the covenant theology people say, well, that since the Pharisees failed to teach about lust, Jesus was condemning the Pharisees. Now, as I said, they did teach against lust. So how do they deal with that? Well, covenant theology has got to go a little bit further and say, look, the Pharisees' prohibitions, like the ones I just read you, they were for external acts. They weren't for internal attitudes. So Jesus was condemning the Pharisees for not emphasizing internal acts. Now that makes logical sense, but where's the evidence for it? There's, this is utter speculation with no proof at all. There's no proof. I looked in Hendrickson, my reform commentator, he offered no proof. He just said, this is what the Pharisees are doing because I say so, that's the way it is, but there's no proof. So looking at the scoreboard again, New Covenant Theology 2, Covenant Theology, nothing. Right, let's look at the third antithesis, easy divorce versus hard divorce. Now, divorce, of course, is a difficult subject. I'm going to try to get, give you some Old Testament background so you can understand this. Jesus says it was also said, that means of old, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. 
But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes a commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, Old Testament background, this is what in uh, what Moses said in the law, Deuteronomy 4, verse 1, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, etc. Indecency is the standard of divorce in the Mosaic law. The question is, is what does indecency mean? That is the key question. It, to answer that question saw, would solve a lot of controversy, but unfortunately people are not sure what Moses meant by indecency. Now, Whatever that indecency was, it was impossible that it be adultery, because if a wife committed adultery, her punishment, according to the law, was stoning, not divorce. So it can't be adultery. But now there were two schools of the Pharisees. There was the Shammai school. That was the strict school. They were the fighting fundies of the Jewish kingdom. They said that what Moses meant was some kind of serious sexual sin, not adultery, because they'd be the wife would be stoned for that, but something besides that. Lesbianism, bestiality, for example. If they had pornography back then, that would do. But the other school of the Pharisees was the Hillel view, which says that a man under Moses' law could divorce his wife for frivolous reasons. She talks too much, she burps too much, she burns the food, she giggles too much, she gossips too much, whatever. That's fine, man can put her away. And so the idea, according to this view, the Hillel liberal view is that Moses is saying, you can put her away for any reason, but you gotta give her a certificate of divorce, of divorce to protect her to, so she can prove that she has indeed be, been divorced and can remarry. Now, the new covenant position is this. The indecency that Moses was talking about was frivolous things. Moses is saying, look, yeah, you can divorce for your wife burning your toast and things like that. You can do that. That's what Moses meant. So this is Moses who says this, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. The Jews in Moses' day were in fact giving easy divorces based upon what Moses said. Moses restricted that by requiring a certificate of divorce to protect the woman divorcee. Why, as he said, Jesus says in Matthew 19, and we're going to come back to this, because of the hardness of their hearts. That's why he allowed such the divorces for such stupid reasons. But now Jesus changes the law from, a, from frivolous indecency to sexual immorality. So now he's tightened up the law of Moses and therefore he's changed the law of Moses and therefore he's a new lawgiver. And now he's our standard in the kingdom. And we can't go around divorcing our wives for some stupid reason. Now that seems straightforward, easy enough. How do the covenant theology people respond to that? They take the Hillel view of the interpretation of Moses. They say, excuse me, they take the Shammai view. They say that indecency is serious sexual immorality. And Jesus allows divorce for sexual immorality. The Greek word is pronea. So Jesus did not change Moses' law. Moses says, you got to have some kind of serious sexual immorality to divorce your wife. Jesus says the same thing. So there's no change. And then the covenant theology people go further and say, look, the Pharisees were doing frivolous divorce. And so when Jesus says it was also said, he was talking about Pharisees who were saying, when you divorce your wife, give her a certificate of divorce. Not Moses, but the Pharisees. So Jesus is contradicting the Pharisees. Now, here's the proof from my Reformed commentators. Do the Pharisees practice, were they practicing frivolous divorce? Such seems to have been the opinion of scribes and Pharisees. No sites. No quotations, no evidence. It just seems to be. Now, I'm, I'm picking on Hendrickson because I had his commentator, but I've read a lot of reform stuff, and I noticed this over and over and over again. Well, where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? So I finally got a little tired of it, and I found a Ph.D. professor, a reform professor at a Christian college in California, 
and she was an expert. She had written her PhD on the people at the Westminster Conf uh, Assembly that did the Westminster Confession of Faith, 1646. And there was a big law controversy there, controversy over the law. They said they were still having problems with the law, having with it today. And she wrote her dissertation on all the people that were involved in the controversy and took the lead at the convention, at the assembly. And I figured, well, maybe she'll know something. Well, she never answered my email. So I don't think she had any evidence. So where is the evidence that Pharisees allowed frivolous divorce? Isn't it much easier just to say, hey, this is Moses, said give her a certificate of divorce, the easy stuff, the frivolous stuff, but man, Jesus is tightening up the rules for his kingdom. Now, here's another response that New Covenant theology makes about the third antithesis. A strict view of indecency makes no sense. Remember the covenant people said, Moses is saying you have to have some kind of sexual immorality like lesbianism or bestiality, something really, really serious before you can do divorce. That makes no sense. Because why would Jesus say in Matthew 19, 8, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. Now think about it. You got a heart, you got a, excuse me, you got a wife that's just committed bestiality and you say, I want a divorce and Jesus, and, and Jesus would say to you, well, you got a hard heart for that. No, there's, why would, there's no, Soft hearts, if someone, if someone has a normal heart, he's going to be upset about his wife being a lesbian or committing bestiality or something like that. So that couldn't be what Jesus meant when he was quoting Moses in Matthew 19.8. He was saying the reason that Moses is letting you divorce your wife for all these stupid, frivolous, silly reasons is because you people have such hard hearts that you are throwing your wives out for stupid reasons you don't love your wives. So it has to be the frivolous view, the Hillel view of Moses that makes any sense, any logical sense. And so that means, if so, the covenant theology position is Kaputsky. Score, New Covenant Theology 3, Covenant Theology nothing. Now let's go to the fourth antithesis, false oaths versus no oaths at all. Jesus says, again, you have heard that it was said to you, see the purple there, that's the, what was said of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform the Lord which you have sworn. This is a quote from Leviticus 19, 12. But I say to you, there's the antithesis, do not take an oath at all. Now, I'm going to give you the covenant theology position first. The Pharisees were perverting the law. For example, swearing by Jerusalem was not valid, but swearing toward Jerusalem was valid. Another, another good one was, if you swear by the gold of the temple, that's not a good oath because gold is commercial, it's dirty, it's filthy lucre. So that, that oath is no good. But if you swear by the temple itself, the temple where all the sacrifices are, that's spiritual, so that oath is good. And so they would say, yeah, I promise you, creditor, I'll pay you back. I swear by the gold of the temple, I'll pay you back. And so the creditor thinks, oh, he's going to pay me back. Well, no, when it comes time to pay, the Pharisee will say, no, nah, I didn't swear by the temple. I only swore by the gold of the temple, that kind of thing. So the Pharisees were perverting the law. And so that's what Jesus, when he says, I say to you, do not take an oath at all. He's saying, don't take a false oath like the Pharisees. And as a matter of fact, this is a side topic, but I realize that there's a lot of Christians that, take Jesus literally here and say, don't take an oath at all. I will tell you that position is not sustainable because there are lots of people that took oaths. Paul the apostle took oaths. You know, Jesus took an oath when, when the high priest said, I adjure you, are you the Messiah? Uh, it, so that, that I'm not going, I'm not even going, that, that's a side argument here. So this is the covenant theology position. And and this one, New Covenant, uh, covenant Theology says, you're exactly right. How do we know they're, that the Covenant Theology people are right? Because now they've got evidence. Where's the evidence? I don't have the sites in front of me, but you remember in the, in the, uh, in the Gospels when Jesus would look at the Pharisees and say, ah, you know, you make, you're, you're saying swear by the temple, and you swear, you're swearing by the gold of the temple, not by the temple, and the oaths are no good, and, that, and so forth. So, yeah, there's proof that the Pharisees were perverting the law of Moses there. And so Jesus was complaining about the Pharisees. Now, just because the covenant theology people are right about one of these antitheses, remember what the burden of proof is. 
they've got to they've got to win six to nothing. They're already down. What is it? Three to three to nothing now. Now they got one, so it's three to one. They already lost because they've got to they've got to win all four in order to show that Jesus didn't change Moses. Now let's look at antithesis number five: retribution versus no resistance. Jesus said in the Summer on the Mount, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, the new covenant position here is, look, Jesus is quoting Moses literally. This is Exodus 21, 24, and this is exactly what it says. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So why would we think that's who Jesus is quoting? And he's saying, but even though Moses say, says that, but I'm saying don't resist. Now, what that legal prescription was there in the law, it, it forced the Jewish judges back then to meet out proportional judgment. It actually did two things. One is it forced them to actually carry out a judgment, to carry out justice, because a lot of times the, the the lawyers were saying, well, you know, I don't want to get involved in this. I'm just not going to give the judgment. And they said, nope, if somebody knocks out somebody's eye, they got to get recompense for it. Don't say you're not going to carry out a judgment for that. And also, when you do carry out the judgment, make sure it's proportional. Don't give capital punishment for going 40 miles an hour in a 35-mile-hour speed zone, that kind of thing. So it was a judicial principle. It was for the courts. Now, rules for the civil judiciary in the Old Testament cannot be used in the New Testament. And I cannot tell you how important this is. This passage right here has been misused by more Christians and more people than I think any other verse in the Bible. If you use uh, judicial principles, eye for an eye or tooth for tooth in the New Testament, what do you end up with? Private revenge. For example, let's say somebody steals my car. And I say, okay, that's fine. I'm going to go steal his car. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's fair, isn't it? But what is that really? That's revenge. That's private revenge. You're supposed to go to court and let the courts get you compensated for it. So you can't take eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and use it in personal relationships, especially in kingdom relationships. Likewise, you can't take Jesus' rule of non-resistance, do not resist the one who is evil, you can't read that back in the Old Testament law or into anybody's law, any civil law. For example, if somebody steals my car and I go to the judge and say, I need to get recompensed for my stolen car, and the judge says, no, you need to turn the other cheek, brother. You shouldn't resist the one who was evil. Well, that's absurd. I remember one time I was in college and reading about a defense minister for the British government in the turn of the 20th century, early 1900s, and somebody presented this to him, the Sermon on the Mount, and he said, look, if I have got to defend Britain with this kind of thinking, I'd rather be a Buddhist or something to that effect, and I remember thinking, well, how do I answer that? How, you know, it just created conflict in me. Well, there's no conflict. Eye for an eye is for the courts and for the government and for the police and for the military, do not resist is for people in the church. Simple as that. So if you read non-resistance into the Old Testament law or anybody's law, American law, any law, injustice results because people can't get justice in the courts. Now, so Jesus' laws are different than Moses' laws. Why are Old Testament laws harsher than Jesus' law? Because they are for an unregenerate people. Now, this is something a lot of people don't think about too much. Those Jews that came out of Israel, were they followers of Yahweh? Did they really believe in Yahweh? Well, they started out, you know, at the golden calf incident. A lot of them got killed there. They, ra they ran after the idols of Moab and had adultery with the Moabite women. All, all, every one of them under 20 was laid waste in the wilderness because they didn't believe God. They didn't go into their promised land. Those people were unregenerate, and they had to have harsh laws. And people always say, well, the laws in the Old Testament are so hard. It's so hard. You know, you got to stone an, un, a rebellious kid. Yeah, because if you didn't do that, the whole nation would have fallen apart. But we are not in a civil government. We're in the church. Jesus' law is for a regenerate people 
We have the Holy Spirit, and Jesus can tell us not to resist one who is evil. And that's hard. I remember I was in China, and somebody cheated me out of 70 RMB, which is, I guess, about $10. And there was no question he cheated me. And I went back and asked for to get my money back. And he just looked at me very arrogantly, wouldn't give it back. And it took me two years to get over that, $10. So, and I remember thinking, I've got to turn the other cheek. I mean, I, and another thing, too, about this is that it doesn't mean, then, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And just it, it, you mean hotel laws are harsher means like the they kept the harsh thing because of the unregenerate people or the hotel laws itself is for unregenerate unregenerate people. Just a clarity. You got my question. I'm sorry, so si, I say that again. I didn't hear. Somebody help me. I'm having trouble with my speakers. So si, I say that again. No, I I, uh, I asked the, the OT laws laws are harsher because for the un, for the sake of unregenerate people, or the OT laws itself are for unregen, unregenerate people. The harsher is only for unregenerate people. You you mean? You got my question. No? I'm not sure you're saying are the Old Testament laws only for unregenerate people? Is that what you're saying? Ask yeah, 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 yeah. Miss or or is it only the harsh the adjective of harsh is for unregenerate people? I, you got you didn't okay, let me type it. Steve, can, Steve, could you understand? Wow, well, uh, now. <laughs> I think I think uh, I'm sorry, Sam. I'm not really sure what you're saying. I think what you're saying is is the. I think he's thing. saying. Uh, I think he's saying. Uh, are the Old Testament laws for the unre unregenerate or unbelieving people, or unregenerate people, or uh, uh, the, I think the last part. I think he's saying is like. Uh, uh, the harsh, uh, because it's harsh, it is for unregenerate people, I think. I don't know. Uh, well, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. The reason they have to be harsher is because unregenerate people do not bend themselves to the law of God. They fight. They're stiff-necked. But if you've got the Holy Spirit living in you as the Son of God, then the Holy Spirit will then make you bend, make you submit, make you yield to God's will. And so, therefore, if you've got people like that, you can have a higher law. You can have a tougher law. You can say, nah, I, not only do I not want you to murder, I don't even want you to get angry at somebody. Well, a civil law is never going to tell uh, somebody in the court, you shouldn't be angry at somebody. There's not a court in the world that would say that because courts know they can't control that sort of thing. But Jesus says, in my kingdom, yes, sir. The Holy Spirit is there, and I've got children that are obedient to me. I can demand that they not be angry and that they can turn the other cheek. So Jesus' laws in the Summer on the Mount are for Christians. They're for the church. They are not for a civil legal system. Okay. Okay? Yeah, yeah. All right. Now let's leave, see what the covenant theology people say about this. They said now they got they got a little stronger position here, and this is kind of clever. They say that Moses prohibited revenge just like Jesus did. So Jesus is not a new lawgiver. They quote Leviticus 19:18, which says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. Well, there Moses said, Don't take vengeance, and Jesus is saying, Don't take vengeance, which is the same thing as saying, Don't resist the one who's evil. Somebody slaps you on the cheek, don't slap him back and get revenge. And so therefore, Jesus is not really changing Moses. Now, I didn't see Riesinger deal with this. So my only solution to that is, well, maybe Jesus didn't change Moses at Leviticus 19.18. But he does at Exodus 21.24 right here. He, changed it. he says, but I say to you, don't resist. So I find it hard to believe that Jesus was not changing Moses' as law well there. All right, so the covenant theology position on this 
fifth antithesis is that Jesus is not changing Moses, but he's rebuking the Pharisees who took the Old Testament judicial principle as a tool for revenge. Now, I think the Pharisees were probably doing that, but, but still, uh, Jesus, no matter what the Pharisees were doing, Jesus was changing Moses. He was going from a judicial principle to a kingdom principle. All right, let's look at this. Where's the evidence that the Pharisees were taking that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and using it as a tool for revenge? I said it's, it's, it is logical that they might be doing that, but where's the evidence that they were actually doing it? Here's what William Hendrickson says. He's the Reformed commentator. They, the Pharisees, quoted this commandment of Moses to defeat its very purpose of preempting revenge. The purpose of this law was to stop people from having private revenge. There's no question about it. If the courts don't give you justice, what do people do? They go out and get justice themselves privately. And so Moses is saying, look, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Give the eye, give the tooth. Because if you don't, somebody's going to privately go out and do it. And so the purpose of the law was to stop revenge. It's one of the purposes of the law. And that's all right. That's fine. But then Hendrickson says the Pharisees are taking what Moses said, eye for an eye, and then they're going out and creating private revenge with the eye for an eye. In other words, twisting Moses and making Moses say exactly backwards of what Moses meant. Moses says, I want this eye for an eye law so that there will not be private revenge. And the Pharisees are saying, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. Yeah, so we can get private revenge. All right, so where's this evidence? Now, here's where he quotes right here. Matthew 15, 3. Matthew 15, 3 and 15, 6. So I said, ah, oh, I've got some evidence that the Pharisees are doing some bad stuff. Matthew 15, 3. He answered them, why do you break God's commandment? Because of your tradition. And I thought to myself, what has that got to do with non-resistance and revenge? Here's another quote, 15, 6. He does not have to honor his father. In this way, you have nullified the word of God because of your tradition. Well, it's talking about not honoring your father and mother, not taking eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and nullifying the word of God because of that tradition. He has no sights. Now, if somebody just write a commentary that's that thick and you can't come up with any sights, I'm starting to get suspicious. Score is now four to one. You covenant theology over covenant theology. Now, let's look at antithesis number six. Hating your enemy versus loving your enemy. Matthew 5, 43 through 44, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. All right, covenant theology position. Hate your enemy is not in the Old Testament. And that's true. It's not in the Old Testament. And so the covenant theology people say that Therefore, Jesus is complaining about a Pharisaic perversion of Moses. They're going around saying, hate your enemy. It's okay to hate your enemy because Moses had all these laws against the Moabites and the Ammonites and all these people. And so, therefore, it's perfectly all right to hate your enemy. Well, that sounds very logical. And then the covenant theology people say, also, love your neighbor is in the Old Testament, Leviticus 19.18, which they cite over and over again which says, love your neighbor as yourself. So if Jesus doesn't change Moses from hate to love, and as a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, in Moses, in the law of Moses, Leviticus 19, 18, there is love already there in the Old Testament, and Jesus says, well, love your enemies in the New Testament, then Jesus is merely an expositor of Moses. He does not elevate Moses to a higher level. So there's no change from the Old Testament to the New Testament, therefore we win. Here's a quote from A.W. Pink. Some of you might know him. He says, quote, The Pentateuch will be searched in vain for any precept which required the Israelites to entertain any malignity against their foes. Thou shalt hate thine enemies was a rabbinical invention, pure and simple. Does A.W. Pink give a quote to show where a rabbi actually said that? No, he did not. So, where is the evidence, the New Covenant theology people might ask, where is the evidence that Pharisees thought hate your enemy? Here's Hendrickson, the Reformed commentator. He says he must have learned it from the scribes and Pharisees. Must have learned it. The person who said, heard of old, 
the person who of old, who it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, that person must have learned it from the scribes and Pharisees. Must have? That's, there's no evidence. Doesn't, that's just not going to do. Now, the new covenant people have still got a problem here because Moses never said, hate your enemy. And so that leaves New Covenant theology open to the charge that maybe Jesus is complaining about the Pharisees and not Moses. Well, here's how Riesinger answers that. He says, hate your enemy, although it's not literally in the Old Testament, essentially it is. For example, God commands the killing of all Canaanite men, women, and children. Uh, for example, the imprecatory Psalm. Psalm says, dash their teeth against the rocks. That sounds like hate to me. How about Deuteronomy 23, 6? You shall not seek their, talking about the Ammonites and the Moabites, their peace nor their prosperity. And so Jesus might have just been summarizing all the attitudes that Moses had, was saying that the Israelites should have toward the enemies. He was just summarizing it by saying, hate your enemy, even though he didn't particularly say it in one place. I'm going to give that one to us. Even if I give it to them, it doesn't matter. So, New Covenant Theology, when on the six antitheses. Now, I was, I, I was playing offense there. I think my side had most of the evidence on its side, and I think the Reformed people are very, very weak, and I think they're just quoting each other when they try to prove to themselves that they're right about this. And I've read uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, for example, holds the Reformed view. Pink, any Reformed person you read is going to say that, and I just swallowed it whole hog because I, I didn't see all this. I don't believe it anymore. But now I need to play some defense. Matthew 5, 17 through 19. This is a key passage in the conflict between covenant theology and new covenant theology. Now, it's often said that Orthodox preterists will quote that this generation will not pass away until all things are accomplished. And they quote that verse over and over and over again. And that's probably true because it's a key verse. Well, this is what covenant theologians love to quote this verse, because if you can't answer this verse, new covenant theology goes right out the window. And I'll show you why. Verse 17, Matthew 5, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Oh, but new covenant theology people, I thought you said that Jesus abolished the law. Jesus abolished and replaced and fulfilled the Old Testament Mosaic law. But Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law. I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Therefore, I'm establishing the law. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an odor, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now, of course, an iota is like a little tiny little dot in the Hebrew script. In a, in a, well, that's a dash. I'm sorry. An iota would be a dash and a dot would be a little dot. In other words, even the smallest part of the law. Hebrew hyperbole here. He's saying even the smallest part of the law will last until all is accomplished. When heaven and earth pass away, oh, that means the law is going to pass last all the way to the end of time. So why are you new covenant people saying that Jesus abolished the law? You see the problem I've got. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Oh, my goodness. You are relaxing the law of Moses, NCT people. You are saying that Moses is now defunct. He might be valuable. He might show that you're a sinner, and he might have a lot of types and all, but still you're saying that Christians are not under that law anymore. So therefore, you're relaxing that law, and therefore, New Covenant Theology people, you are going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of, God, of heaven. So us Covenant Theology people, we say Moses is a rule of life. We're doing the moral law of Moses, and therefore, we're great in the kingdom of heaven. So you see my problem. Well, I'm going to explain this to you, and I think, I think you'll see that it's not a problem at all. First of all, verse 17, Matthew 5. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, does fulfilling something abolish it? Well, I can give you, well, first of all, let me restate the problem. Doesn't Jesus establish the law by fulfilling it? No, a fulfilled contract is abolished. If I have a contract with you to sell you a computer for $200, if you will pay me $200, you give me the computer and I give you the $200. That piece of paper that that contract is written on, 
is worth nothing in a court of law. A fulfilled contract is abolished. You put it in the file folder and forget it. You can use it for a form, a template, that's fine. But you can't enforce it anymore. It is discharged. And likewise, when Jesus comes, um, when he fulfills the Mosaic law, he abolishes the law. But now, wait a minute, we still got a problem. I'm, I'm, I'm taking care of fulfill right there. You fulfill something, you abolish it. But then the covenant theology person says, but wait a minute. Jesus says, I've not come to abolish the law. And you just said that the law is abolished. Well, how do I handle that? Before the cross, Jesus indeed did not come to abolish the law. Now, if you think about Jesus' ministry, he was constantly jumping on the Pharisees, right? Now, what would be a logical thing to think if you were listening to his ministry? You'd be thinking, he must be against Moses. He must be against the, the, the law because all these Pharisees, they teach the law, and he's jumping on them every chance he gets, so Jesus must be against the law. And Jesus had to guard himself against that. And he said, look, I didn't come here to abolish Moses. That was before the cross, though. But what about after the cross? New Covenant Theology says that after the cross, Jesus fulfilled and abolished the law after the cross. And so there's no problem here in verse 17. We go to verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an odor, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Ooh, that looks bad for my side. It's a problem for New Covenant theology. It sounds like the law is unabolished after the cross. I just finished saying it was, uh, it was unabolished before the cross, but then abolished after the cross. But wait a minute. It says, not until heaven and earth will pass away, nothing, not an odor, a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. How do we handle that? Well, here's the solution to save New Covenant theology. All is accomplished on the cross. Didn't Jesus say it is finished when he was on the cross? His sacrificial atoning work on the cross was finished. It was accomplished. And when it was accomplished, that was the end of the law. The law was done away with at the cross. But now we got a problem still. If that's at the cross, how do you handle this until heaven and earth pass away? That's, if that's at the end of time, if you take it literally at the end of time, that's way past the cross. So we, you still haven't solved your problem, you covenant theology. All right, so how do we solve this problem that heaven and earth didn't pass away at the cross? Well, there's two ways you can solve it. I'll give you the standard new covenant way, then I'm going to give you We'll give you another way that I've come up with. Here's the, the first solution, that what Jesus is saying here is Hebrew hyperbole. To, to paraphrase it, he's saying, you might as well tell me that heaven and earth will pass away as tell me that an iota or a dot will pass away before the cross. It's not going to happen. Heaven and earth's not going to pass away, and not one jot or tittle of the law is going to pass away before the cross. Does that make sense? Let me just ask everybody, do you understand what that argument is? You don't have to buy it, but I mean, do you understand it? Everybody? All right, speak now, forever hold your peace. Let me give you, let me give you option number two. About how do you handle heaven and earth didn't pass away? Heaven and earth stands for the Jewish temple, and you think, well, wait a minute. Heaven and earth does not stand for the Jewish temple. You will be surprised at how much rabbinic literature talks about the Jewish temple being heaven and earth. Now, I'm going to give you that evidence because you're not going to believe me until I show it to you. I came up with the idea when I was reading David Chilton, who's a theologian who wrote a big commentary on Revelation, and he was not even talking about this topic here. In fact, he would not, just, he would not agree with me at all on New Covenant theology. He was a theonomist. But he did mention just in passing that heaven and earth stood for the Jewish temple. And then when you talk about heaven and earth pass away, he's talking about when the temple will pass away, which would be the Mosaic Law, that stands for the Mosaic Law. It will pass away for the Jews in AD 70. Gone. So then accomplished would be at AD 70, not AD 30, and the, the, passing, the, um, the passing of the law away would be for Jews in AD 70. Of course, the law for Christians passes away in AD 30. But either way, Jesus could be saying that, all right? So now I want to show you, uh, let, me, let me give you a quote from the scriptures itself in Hebrews 12, 26. Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now Hebrews is written in the mid-60s. 
And I am convinced that the author was trying to tell the Christians there, you need to not run back to Judaism because Judaism is about to be destroyed, i.e. in 8070, because they had the Olivet Discourse. They knew the destruction was coming in one generation. And so the author is saying, I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. He was talking about the Jewish geopolitical order that was going to bite the dust in just a few years. Now, let me give you uh, some, a site, uh, not just a site, but a section of, of text here from a guy named Paul T. Penley. I don't, I don't know this guy, but listen to what he says. Jews did not always mean the physical universe when they spoke of heaven and earth together. In Jewish literature, the temple was a portal connecting heaven and earth. They called it the navel of the earth and the gateway to heaven, just like the Mesopotamian Tower in Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. The temple connected God's realm to where humans lived. All right, so it was a portal connecting heaven and earth. To reflect that belief, the Jerusalem temple had to be built like a microcosm of the universe. We typically overlook how literally true the temple hymn preserved in Psalm 78, 69 is. He built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth, which he has found forever. There's heaven, there's earth, his sanctuary like heavens and earth. That's in Psalms. The actual holy place and most holy place inside the temple building were constructed like heaven and earth. And the courts outside represented the sea. I'm not making this stuff up. That's not me. That's Penley saying that. Now, let me just summarize here. He's saying that you got the Holy of Holies. That, of course, refers to where the Shekinah glory is. That's God. That's heaven. You go through the Holy of Holies into the holy place. That's where the priest could go. That was the earth. And I'm, I'm not going to read this because it's going to take too long. But uh, the, the, the curtain that was between the Holy of Holies and the holy place had earth, air, fire, water on it. Uh, the, those were the four elements on, the, on that. This is according to Josephus. And uh, therefore, you're going the, through that curtain into the holy place, and that stood for the earth. And then once you go through the door of the holy place, you look out of the wide courts in the temple, and that stood for the sea, because back then they believed that the earth was surrounded by the flat sea. And some quotes to stand for this, we got Josephus, we've got the book of Enoch, we got Psalm 78. We got uh, some rabbinic tradition, Numbers, Rabbi 13, 19. I'm not sure what that is. We got the Talmud. I, in other words, there's a lot of evidence for this. Chilton didn't give any evidence, but I've found some sense. So if that's true, we got three options to handle when all is accomplished before the law passes. He could be at the cross in AD 30. That's New Covenant Theology option number one. That is the standard interpretation, and that's probably what I would do just talking to somebody who wouldn't go into this option number two, the structure of the temple in 8070, but I'm not sure that that's not what Jesus meant. Or it could be the end of time, which is the covenant theology solution. Now, let's look at the covenant theology solution and see what the problem is. For I truly say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an oda, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. All is accomplished. That's the end of the world. Not one iota, not one dot of the law is going to pass away to the end of the world. Now, that helps the covenant people when they say the moral law lasts all the way to the end of the, wor of the world. But what about the laws that say you have to stone a rebellious kid or that you can't plant cucumbers and tomatoes in the same garden or that an adulterous wife has got to mix some water with the dirt of the tabernacle and drink it? for the trial by ordeal and all that stuff that obviously doesn't apply today. Jesus said, not one iota, not one dot. That includes the civil and the ceremonial law. The Reformed people say the civil and ceremonial law, well, that passed away, but the moral law stays. But Jesus didn't say uh, the moral law, the moral law will not pass from the law until all is accomplished. He says, not an iota, not a dot, nothing of a law will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So, if accomplished is the end of the world, not one iota nor a dot is going to pass, that means all the judicial laws are in effect now, and so we should be stoning our rebellious children, and we should allow polygamy and slavery. Now, you know, there are some people who do believe that, theonomists, and that I consider that anathema. Covenant theology answer to that is that so-called trichotomy of the law. We got the Judicial law, we got the ceremonial law, and the moral law. The judicial and ceremonial law passed away. The moral, moral law lasts all the way to the end of the world. But that's not what Jesus said. He said, not one iota, not a dot. 
nothing in the judicial law, nothing in the ceremonial law will pass until all is accomplished. So I think that that doesn't hold water for the covenant theology people. So you see what looked like trouble for me is actually trouble for the reformed people. Last verse, I'm almost finished here. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Do new covenant theology advocates relax the laws of Moses? No, we do not. I just went through the sixth antithesis showing that the law of Christ is stricter than the law of Moses. Moses prohibited murder. Jesus prohibits anger. Moses prohibited adultery. Jesus prohibited lust. Let's just take it straight and understand it the way it reads naturally. Thank you very much for this. And I am finished. Two minutes past time. I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to have to take questions now or comments. And at the, I think Steve at 920 is going to stop us. And I'm going to give a summary of five sessions real quick, a real fast overview. So anybody got any questions? Hey, can you hear me? Yes, I did. Who was that? Uh, this is Wes. I see you, Wes. Go ahead. Hey, uh, I just want to make a general comment. Um, what you were saying about um, heaven and earth, uh, God's space and man's space uh, being a Jewish idea of the temple. Uh, that's something that yeah. I've heard also from uh, a Hebrew scholar named Tim Mackey. Um, he, he gives this idea, the same idea of what you just said, but it was it was really helpful for me to think of it as almost like a Venn diagram where you have um, heaven and earth. And then there's this little part where they intersect and that's where the temple was. That's where the garden of Eden was at the beginning of time. And then that's where the temple was. And then once the temple passed away, now they, we have that God space, man space in our hearts because we are the temple of the Holy ghost. Uh, that's pretty good. Kind of a cool, um, yeah, and who, a cool and idea. Who, who has that analogy? I'd like to see it. Um, it's Tim Mackey. Uh, I can send you his information. It's uh, He started a ministry called The Bible Project uh, yeah. in Portland. Uh, so, I would like to see it. I would like to see it very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Nobody. That means either you didn't like it or didn't understand it or you're tired. <laughs> well, then, let me uh, bring up something as Steve brought up when I was talking to him about this, and I actually meant to look before tonight and I forgot to do it. So he brought up the problem about this heaven and earth thing that you mentioned, Wes, about if Jesus said heaven and earth will not pass away until all is accomplished, would the listeners of Jesus, would they have understood that the heaven and earth refer to the temple and that it would not pass away until 8070? And I responded immediately, well, Matthew was the Jewish of Jewish gospel writers. He, 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 was, he was Jewish from the top to the bottom. And then Steve said, well, if Jesus didn't say this in the other gospels, like Luke, who was Greek, well, if he, because Luke liked to explain when he said something Jewish, he would explain it. Then that would um, strengthen my case there. That um, it, well, well, it would hurt my case if Luke said heaven and earth and didn't explain it as being the temple. So I didn't go back and look at the other gospels, but that might be something to look at. Well, let me ask you this. Did everybody understand? I don't, I'm not asking that you agree with it. But did you understand the, the issues between covenant theology and new covenant theology? Did you, did you understand what they were? Yes. Yes, yeah, Ben. Okay, well, good. Uh, you ex yeah, you told a, hello. Yes, yes, I go ahead. Yeah, is my voice clear? Uh, halfway. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, you you mentioned about one thing like uh, 
the law of moses uh, it was there uh, uh, it was satisfying the judicial system but it was not helpful to build the kingdom of heaven means the kingdom of god i'm sorry i didn't get it the old testament okay. law did not do what the you, you you told the old testament uh, the law that was there it was for the judicial system but it was not helping to build the kingdom of god the old testament law was there for not for the purpose of building the kingdom of god is that what you said yeah yeah can you explain on that well the purpose of the old testament law was to uh create a theocracy a nation that would that would contain the messiah that would that would allow the messiah to be born so god had to keep that the jewish nation together against all sorts of opposition first from the egyptians and then the amalekites and all the other people who attacked them as they were going through the desert and so basically they were under military discipline i mean basically they were going through and had to fight as they went and they had no military experience they were slaves when they came out of egypt and um they were going through a horrible I, desert i've been through that desert uh it's terrible i don't I, in fact i remember thinking as we were driving through i said how in the world did moses get these people and we we're talking about what a million a couple of me i forgot tons lots of people through the desert and our tour guide said you know if moses had come through this place here um which was a wadi it was dry at the time we were there in the summer he says all it took was one little rainstorm and there would've been a flash flood that came through there and would wiped them out so i mean it was an incredible thing for moses to get the children of israel into the promised land incredible and so when people say well it was so bad god commits genocide he's killing all these uh, canaanites and all those canaanites had to be killed their cup of iniquity had been filled up they had been they were sacrificing their own children they had gotten so degenerate that they that god said i'm going to wipe you out and if he hadn't wiped them out the children of israel would not have made it to the promised land and all the prophecies about the messiah would have failed and we wouldn't be here today we wouldn't be saved so yeah it, it that was the purpose of the law is is to provide a nation for the messiah to be born in and in order to do that those laws had to be very very strict could you uh could you talk on that for a little bit more um whenever you're talking to somebody and 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 explaining that god hasn't changed although the law has been fulfilled god did uh, what would be a good way to explain to them that you know yeah that god did not change even though the law so. even even though we're under a different law well sure yeah. i mean if somebody in the old testament let's say murdered somebody well god's moral law is the same yeah you're not supposed to murder people in the new testament either but it's not the church that executes capital punishment on the offender it's the civil law that does it but god just as upset about it in the old testament as was in the new testament just a different system of law that, that handles it i like to use the analogy of well hey i'm in america and i go to china well i'm under the chinese law there the chinese law says don't commit murder and the american law says don't commit a murder well it's the same moral principle but it's two different law systems two different court systems you know things are different but the same moral principles there and in fact if you look at any it, i've actually looked at some of the hammurabi code you know the famous babylonian law code that's written on that rock that's in the louvre in france and uh i i just am amazed it's the same sort of law that we have today about foreclosing on things and um property disputes and boundary disputes and passing property down from parents to kids it's just amazing i'm talking about 1700 bc so the principles of law are basically the same you have to adjust for circumstances i mean this world was a theocracy we're not a theocracy now but if you start trying to take the mosaic law and put it on the christian today you end up with nothing but trouble nothing but trouble but it's the same god he's got the same moral principles but it's a different different law system now law of christ now Can i make a a comment real quick on that you sure may you sure may um something that was helpful for me because i've been wanting the same thing colton um something that was helpful for me was i forget 
which of you said it, it was either Dan or uh, Steve, that God had certain laws for certain purposes. And when those purposes were fulfilled, then uh, that's why we could see something different in the Old Testament than the New Testament is because we don't need those laws anymore. It's not that God changed. He just had certain laws for certain times. Um, that was super helpful for me. Amen. Well, shall I go ahead and do the summary, Steve, now, or what do you think? Is that a yes? Okay. Yeah, go ahead and do it. That might spark some questions all by itself. Okay. I've got an easy audience here. I don't think people are fighting me like I'm used to. All right, let me see if I can find my PowerPoints. There we go. I've lost your pictures, but all right. Here, I, I'm assuming everybody's seeing my PowerPoints. Am I correct? Yep. All right. Session one was three theological options, reform, covenant theology, dispensational theology, new covenant theology. Options for what? To explain the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, reform covenant theology puts too much Old Testament in the New Testament. For example, the Sabbath worship, for example, tithing to the ecclesiastical institution that they were under. Uh, that's what reformed people believe, covenant people believe. Dispensational theology, on the other hand, says there's not enough church because the church is just a gap. It's a parenthesis. It's too much millennialism. All, it, the, the promises of the Old Testament, the laws, the types, the prophecies, they tend to all end up in the future in the pine sky by and by, and we don't get it. We don't get the benefits of them. But New Covenant Theology says, yes, we affirm the church, the glorious church. We're not interested in a future millennium. Most, if not all, New Covenant Theology, theology people are not pre-mill people who believe in a future millennium. They believe that the millennium is between the first and the second advents, the church age. And they, like the covenant people, want to say that the Old Testament is in the New Testament, but not literally, only as types, as fulfilled types. Types are fulfilled in the New Testament. So the Sabbath in the Old Testament is fulfilled in the Sabbath rest that we have in Christ, either in, in the church now or in heaven in the future, and so forth. Now, session two, that was Steve. He was talking about the covenant of Abraham, the land and offspring and the blessings. How, how are those promises, covenant promises fulfilled? Well, New Covenant Theology says they were physically fulfilled in the Old Testament. The land promise was from the Wadi El Arish to the Euphrates River. They got a land. The offspring were the, all the, the, the Jewish descendants of Abraham. And the blessings, in my opinion, were the blessings when Solomon was the chief dog in the ancient Near East, and all people came to him to get his wisdom, get his money, and that kind of thing. So that was physical fulfillment, but the most important thing is that these promises of Abraham, land, offspring, and blessings were spiritually fulfilled in the New Testament. Because Abraham was looking not for a city that, he was looking for a city that had foundations in heaven, not in the earth. Covenant theology, theology as far as I can tell, agrees with New Covenant theology on that point. Dispensationalism, however, takes these physical promises of land, offspring, and blessings and fulfills them literally in the millennium, a future millennium. Session three, Steve went over the covenant of Moses. New covenant theology says that Moses is completely abolished or fulfilled in the New Testament. He's completely abolished and therefore fulfilled in the New Testament by the law of Christ. Covenant theology says Moses is only two-thirds abolished by the time we get to the New Testament. The judicial and ceremonial law were abolished, but the moral law endures. Dispensationalism says that the covenant of Moses was abolished in the New Testament, but fulfilled in the millennium. Session four, Steve's session on Romans 11 and the fate of the Jews. Steve pointed out that New Covenant Theology, and I would say Covenant Theology too, that all Israel is the saved remnant. I need to be careful, not all. I don't think all New Covenant Theology people and all 
covenant theology people say that all Israel is a saved remnant, but Steve and I do anyway. There's no promise of a large remnant. There's no promise of a geopolitical Israel. When I say a large remnant, I mean thousands and thousands of people coming to faith, Jews, Jews coming to the uh, to belief at the very end of time. Now, it's interesting. I, John Willerton, who I don't know if he's on the, on the Zoom call tonight, but he was doing the self-test, and he called me up and mentioned, he said, you said that nobody believes that all Israel being saved refers to every 100% of all Jews. And I said, well, I don't know, I don't know of any responsible, but not even dispensationalists believe that. He says, I've run into a lot of people, not at the theological level, but just average Christians who, are, who think that all Israel means 100% of the Jews are going to be saved. And in fact, Mr. Hagee out in Texas says that you don't even have to be a Christian. If you're a Jew, you're automatically saved. So that's how that goes. Uh, and there's no promise of a geopolitical Israel that we don't need to get all excited about what's happening in the Middle East. Of course, dispensationalism says the opposite. There's going to be a large influx of Jews at the end of time, and that ge ge there's going to be a revived nation of Israel. Well, the nation of Israel is here now in 1948, and that nation will be all the way at the end of time, and it will be the focus of prophecy and so forth. Session five, we just went over. New Covenant Theology says Jesus replaces and elevates Moses. Covenant Theology says Jesus restates Moses with no change. Dispensationalism probably agrees with New Covenant Theology. Now that is a quick summary of some complicated theology, three very well-entrenched theological systems. I asked the question, does it really matter? Does it really matter which one of these things you believe? Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> Somebody agreed with me there, I hear. Here's some benefits from choosing New Covenant Theology. You can the back, cut your grass man. on Sunday. You can cut your grass on Sunday and be no, guilt-free. All right, we need some mute. We need everybody to mute, please. You can cut your grass on Sunday and be guilt-free. You can cheerfully give how much you want to whom you want, to whom you want. You can avoid hair-splitting justifications for infant baptism. You can forget about establishing a Christian nation. There never was such a thing. You can forget about being panicked over news from the Middle East. You can follow Jesus and his Holy Spirit for your sanctification. You can truly be free from the law. Folks, that's important. That's practical. This is not just academic theology. So anyway, Steve and I would like to thank you very much for attending our New Covenant Theology Seminar. As he said, you were guinea pigs. We've learned a lot using Zoom doing this. It's, it's a lot different than teaching it live. And you've been a good audience, and we appreciate it much. Thank you so much. I see Thank April Chapman. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Dan and Brother Steve. You're welcome. Thanks for tuning You're in welcome. early in India. Yeah. I admire you. I could not do that. <laughs> and thank you for not making us fly to India to teach that. We really appreciate it. It's so easy to do it from here. <laughs> yeah. Now you can teach it in India instead of us. No, I, I, I got to study a lot before doing this. I need to, I need more clarity for, for it. I, uh, Well, if Steve and I ever expanded this, we thought we would do one. Oh, this is an idea I've been thinking about at least is we could do a session on Sunday Sabbath and tithing and infant baptism, because those are the things that always come up. Are they not in the, at the church level? I see, I see that Tiffany shaking her head and agreeing with me. That's true. <laughs> Just last night I had dinner with a new church member and he said his last church, the preacher got up and said, if you don't tithe, you're not a Christian. Oh, my gosh. He was that strong about it. Yeah. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's abominable. <clears throat> so I do have one, one last question. Sure. Um, whenever Jesus was, like, you know, living his life, he was establishing a new law, um, but it's – and stuff with uh, Pharisees, um, it does seem like he was still 
fulfilling the law of Moses because, you know, until all these things are fulfilled, then the law was passing away. So whenever he, uh, like, for example, uh, his disciples are eating the, the grain, uh, they really weren't afraid of in doing that. And right. he showed, or like whenever he worked on the, you know, filled on the Sabbath, like he's mixing the mud, you know, he's still fulfilling the law of Moses. Um, I, yeah, I just had a conversation with him about this. That was what he brought up. And he said, well, we're still under the Mosaic law because Jesus is the law. Um, Well, he he would go out of his way to break the Pharisees' law. He would deliberately confront them and make himself obnoxious to them. But he never violated the Mosaic law. He was trying to show there's a distinction between the two. Right. And, and that's, that's the strength of the covenant the, theology position there, is that, indeed, Jesus was making a lot of distinctions between Moses and the Pharisees. And they just take that general attitude of Jesus and apply it to the Sermon on the Mount. And I bought that for years, but it doesn't work, as, as I think you saw. All right, has everybody talked out? We can shut it down eight minutes early if you so desire. Great teaching, y'all. Great. Thank you, Hunt. Yeah, I thought it was See? really clear. Well, good, good. Really good glad. teaching. Well, if you can think. The problems I have are right now. I was just going to say, I was just going to say that the problem I have is right now in this class, it all makes sense and I'm good to go. And then I'll get out there and have a conversation with somebody and I'll have to say, wait a minute. <laughs> I'll have to try to recall some of these things. And it's a lot harder. Uh, Wes, I have got a ton of stuff you know, on the internet, stuff you can read, uh, and it's short, it's not long. And I noticed as I, was, as I was studying this for myself, it doesn't take long before you get the general idea of what's going on. You might not know every little jot and tittle of it, but it doesn't take long. And what I'll do uh, sometime next week is I'll send everybody a list of kind of like a reading list and maybe even some PDF files of stuff you can read, and you can study this in further depth. And one of the best places to start is to go get on Kindle and go to New Covenant Theology. There's a ton of stuff out there, and they're relatively cheap. And John Gay in England, his stuff is mostly free on Kindle, and he's a great writer. David Gay. Um, I'm sorry, I said John, but say David Gay. And John Riesinger, his stuff is excellent, too. And, and they write it very clearly uh, and, and you know none of this theological jargon is easy to understand so yeah if you if you do that you'll get to the point where you can talk to other people and not have very much trouble with it i mean like for example if you get to a reformed person the first thing i say oh i'm under the ten commandments uh do you worship on saturday i bet the first thing you say do you worship on saturday <laughs> take it from there so Now, I realize you don't know what you don't know, but if you can think of uh, some topics we didn't deal with that we should have, or somehow we should do something different, write us an email or give us a call and let us know about that if something comes to you. Yeah, and I would encourage everyone to take those self-tests. They don't take long, and I've noticed about half of everybody's taken number four or number five. Oh, I was going to say this, too. We put Steve's last two sessions up on YouTube, we already got 65 hits on one and 35 on the other. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And you will find, you will find that New Covenant Theology, for example, if you get on YouTube and do a search on New Covenant Theology or on Facebook, everybody's talking about it now. There's so many people, I can't keep up with how many people are teaching it. So, because there's something wrong with dispensationalism and something wrong with covenant theology. And when you, and when people start feeling that there's something wrong, they start looking for the truth and people start to find it. Even the dispensationalists, I mentioned this in session one, they have almost completely bailed out on all this stuff that we were teaching them about dispensationalism. 
at the seminary level, they almost agree with Steve and me. They still believe in premillennialism, but a lot of this other stuff, they agree with New Covenant theology. They bailed out on that. That is good news. The Christians are willing to take a look at something. A lot of them are looking, and a lot of them are coming our way. Yeah, I actually had a conversation the other day with a guy from a Plymouth Brethren Church, and uh, and he, it was really interesting. He he did not fit many of the categories that we had, you know, put dispensationalists in. He was kind of he, uh, some of the stuff, yes, the the pre mill, all that, uh, but there were some other things that. Um, you know, he wasn't so rigid into the seven dispensations and all that, but he still called himself a dispensationalist. So it was kind of interesting. You know, my wife went to a dispensationalist Bible college, Philadelphia College of the Bible. And when it came Christmas time, they wouldn't let her sing joy to the world. Because in that song, it says he rules the world with truth and grace. But according to dispensationalists, Jesus did not sit on the throne of God during the church age. It's only in the millennium. And so there's an example of how screwed up theology robs Christians. Same thing. A lot of the extreme dispensationalists say that the Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians today. All that stuff I just went through is not for me? Please. I mean, bad. Th I, I, I like to say this. John Maynard Keynes, the old economist, economists said that we are all slaves of a defunct economist. Well, I believe that all Christians are slaves of defunct theologians. We just buy into stuff because somebody, our church leaders tell us, or it's just tradition. We believe it and we don't examine it. And as a result, we rob ourselves. In my humble opinion. Okay, guys, we'll let you go now. Enjoyed it much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Good night. Good to night. see everybody. And well, don't forget the Lord's you, Supper bread tomorrow. Yeah, I'm, I made a big note. I'm going to put it on the seat of my car. <laughs> <laughs> and, Hunt, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Zoom you right after we shut down. I want to tell you about a dream I had last night about you. Uh oh Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, Chris, check on the half and half. Let me know if I need to <laughs> Okay, well, anyway, good right, Hey, bye. I think it's bye, probably guys. still good. Great I'll check it. Bye, y'all. Thanks, guys. Good to see everybody.